can start if you want. All right. So I'd like to show you this uh, radiograph here, which looks um, j maybe just a couple of little things floating around here, a little scar in this location. If we look at a lateral view, we can see that there is bronchial wall thickening corresponding to that left basal stuff. So it looks as if there's some lingular disease here, some bronchiectasis potentially. Uh, let me show you the way things looked a couple of years ago. This is this is a current radiograph from yesterday, and this radiograph is from 2019. You can see this person had all of these nodules all over the place in a bronchial distribution. And this is a patient with cystic fibrosis. So these are mucus plugs, and there are some thick bronchial walls here. You can see some rings and so forth. But most of these blobs are mucus plugs. The mucus plugging has really decreased quite a bit. So why did this happen? It's because of this miracle drug called Trikafta. This person has been on Trikafta for, I think, more than a year, about a year and a half or so. And um, Trikafta is a combination of three different Kaftors, Alexa Kaftor, Iva Crafter, and Teza Kaftor for treatment of cystic fibrosis. These are agents that, um, if I can expand this, I think. How does Trikafta work? It's a uh, it modulates the CTFR protein, which is misfolded and doesn't reach the cell surface effectively in cystic fibrosis. So two of these agents work to improve the folding of the, the, <clears throat> the bad protein, the, CTF, the CFTR protein, and able to get to the surface. And then the third agent binds, I think, to the receptor or binds to the protein and holds the channel open so that more salt can pass through. So three different agents here that work to correct this um, Delta F508 uh, mutation. So it's really a miracle drug. And it's, you know, we have a big adult cystic population here. Number of visits from these people has really dropped. When this drug was in clinical trials, we were one of the trial sites. Uh, it was supposed to be a double blind study, but the patients who were taking the drug felt so much better. And they were they said so to the doctors that it was very clear who was getting the agent and who was getting the placebo. So it's really a remarkable drug. And it changes this disease to be something manageable like uh, diabetes rather than the devastation it was before. So Trikafta, it really works. Has it been shown to improve survival or like digestive issues? Um, that's a good point, and I don't know the answer. So I don't, you know, I've just seen the stuff in the lungs, and I don't know how what it does with, the, say, the pancreatic dysfunction and, mm -hmm. and so forth. That's a very good question. Okay. I can ask a cystic fibrosologist uh, friend about that. All right, just, just curious because... Okay, so um, let me show you this other patient here who also has a cystic fibrosis. And you can see that back in 2019, uh, the time of this radiograph, she has truly messy lungs. Let me shrink this down here. So really horrible looking lungs. I think she was also put on Trikafta. And so her current chest radiographs look a whole lot better. So let me show you um, July radiograph. You can see that the, all that mucus plugging has really decreased substantially. So all these blobs out here and the old radiograph are gone currently. But this woman has um, pretty advanced uh, abnormalities from cystic fibrosis. She's got these cavities, thin-walled cavities and so forth. She is colonized with both Aspergillus and uh, Mycobacterium avium. So she has chronic problems. This is her radiograph in July. And in September, she deteriorated. She had hemoptysis. And this part of the lung filled in. I don't have a radiograph to show you that, but I can show you what her CT in September uh, looks like. And you can see that she's now filled in that, that big cavity that was lurking at the level of the aortic arch. She has some other cavities here. She's got some aspergillus mycetomas in some of these cavities. You can see very nice mycetoma out here. And if we look uh, on a soft tissue window, we can see that the reason that she's hemoptysizing is that she has this pseudoaneurysm up here. 
So this is the cause of hemoptysis. It's probably blood that's filling in this cavity arrangement here. And she got, then got an embolization study. So here is, here's the selective angiogram showing you that pseudo aneurysm. They put some glue in this and then they put some coils in the more proximal arterial branches and, uh, and shut this down. So here's a case of cystic fibrosis with some improvement in her diffuse mucus plugging, probably because of trichapta. I need to check that to uh, make sure I'm not misleading you. Uh, but you know, with her chronic problems, she's still susceptible to some of the bad things that happened to her before she was put on that effective therapy. So she's left with cavities and the potential for bleeding from erosion of, of uh, pulmonary arteries and so forth. Okay, so two cases of cystic fibrosis, um, some improvement from trichapta, but when you're late stage the way this uh, second patient was, you can still have a lot of problems. Okay. All right, thanks, David. Very good, thanks. All right, well, we got everybody here today, so who would like to present next? I can go anytime. Uh, All right, Howard. Okay. Uh, the first patient is a patient being treated for melanoma. And I want to show you a change that occurred over time, which is apparent when looking at the coronal projection. So the timing here is August and January. In January, one can appreciate that the left hemidiaphragm is elevated, and that's a new finding. So let's go and look at that diaphragm. And this was described, but really wasn't, at least in the report, taken further than that. So let's go back now and look at the diaphragm on the coronal projection, excuse me, the axial. Let me mag this up, make sure I have the right comparison. So this is what the hemidiaphragms, the posterior hemidiaphragms and the crura looked like before. And now of course that left hemidiaphragm is going to be up, but let's go just down more inferiorly to see the posterior right hemidiaphragm and the region of the crus. And then if we look for the posterior hemidiaphragm and the cross, now we can see that there is definitely symmetry and that the diaphragm muscle thinning involves not just the anterior hemidiaphragm, which I'm not showing you, but also involves the cross. So we definitely have findings of diffuse muscle atrophy involving the left hemidiaphragm, new from before. So here is the uh, chronology. Um, this patient was put on Pembro in June for a recurrence of melanoma and has remained on that until this was recognized and this developed, at which time the Pembro was stopped. So this is attributed to Pembrolizumab and one can find reports of all kinds of neurological and even muscle abnormalities with immune checkpoint inhibitors. And one can find a case report, for example, like this one, in which a phrenic nerve palsy, in this case, in our case, unilateral, and I don't know why, um, has been attributed to pembrolizumab. Anyone seen a case like this or heard of a case like this of Phrenic nerve palsy from pembrolizumab? No, that's the first time. It's, you see tons of organizing yeah. pneumonia, but. Yeah. There's no other potential cause along the course of the phrenic nerve. So it has been attributed to pembrolizumab. They never had a left sided central venous catheter? 
Not that I know of. Are you thinking That's the of... only other thing I can think about? Yeah, I've never. And didn't hey, get that. Um, a That's catheter not... complication, associated complication? Rarely it can be, yeah. No, don't think so. And no, uh, no history of COVID. Mm, no, not that I know of. Wow. In the case reports, was there any improvement with cessation of the drug? Um, I'd have to read them in some detail. I think they certainly can uh, remove the drug if you can and also treat with steroids. Okay. But I'm not sure there are enough cases because there are other immune-related neurological events like patients can present with findings of a myelitis. Some patients can even present with myasthenia gravis, uh, muscle abnormalities. But I'd have to read some more to see to what extent those may improve. As best I remember, some do get better, but some do not. The, the reason I asked about COVID is um, back in September, uh, a year ago, we had a, a man who had had COVID. And when he was first seen in the emergency room, his left hemidiaphragm was at normal height. But as he recovered from COVID, his left hemidiaphragm became elevated. And at the time I looked up literature and there was no literature on COVID causing uh, phrenic nerve paralysis. Um, he, uh, he showed up again last month and his left hemidiaphragm function has been restored. So it, it's come back. His cruise was somewhat thin, but not all the way atrophied back then. And that has re recovered, has recovered cruise thickness. And now there's a ton of reports looking at the literature again of COVID associated with phrenic nerve palsies. So be aware that there is this new disease out there that does have these potential neurologic complications involving the phrenic nerve. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting, David, because I just, just looked it up real quickly. They also talk about vagal nerve involvement, which of course goes with, maybe related to the, the anosmia, or at least somewhat along those right. lines as well. All right, let me show you uh, this patient. Um, I'll show you the radiograph and the CT alongside each other. The timing is, this is on one day, the CT was the previous day. We have uh, multifocal, multilobar opacities. And yes, indeed, as you'll see on the CT, some of the larger ones are associated with cavitation. And in fact, as you can see here, extensive areas of cavitation. But even more than that, we have, particularly for this relatively large lesion, we have a classic bird's nest sign, an extreme reverse halo sign uh, that we at least associate in the oncologic context with immunosuppression and mucor but a lot of the others have very similar findings. So multifocal opacities with extensive internal necrosis, bird's nest sign. In this patient, this is a consequence of an infection with Klebsiella. I say that because the patient presented with endophthalmitis clinically. And if we look at the uh, globes, we can see there's abnormality here on the right side. Here I'm going to put the description of the orbital CT alongside it. But there were findings on this, as well as, of course, on direct observation of end ophthalmitis as well. And the vitreous in material that was aspirated, tapped, grew out Klebsiella. The patient does have vegetation on a valve as well. So endocarditis, Klebsiella, endophthalmitis, and a very dramatic case of 
pulmonary septic embolism with many bird's nest signs, particularly large over here. I'm trying to recall if I've seen one as florid as this before with a bacterial organism, but I can't quite remember. I have a that, couple of cases of MSSA or MR staff basically leading to this. I just actually had one this morning. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll show, I'm actually gonna, because you're showing okay. up, I'm gonna show it next, but yeah. Great, okay, pretty dramatic. And this one is um, interesting presentation. So I read a chest radiograph on this person for a cough, a clinic patient. And I'll put up the lateral alongside it. I'll give you a moment just to look at it to see what you see. Bit of an eye test. Not findings that are associated with a cough as such, but an abnormal opacity, uh, particularly well seen on two projections. So really subtle here. And we see it here. And to go back to the lateral from before 2005, I'll bring that up. You can see the opacity is new. So a new opacity, but a patient with sternal wires. So you might, of course, ask, why did the patient have the stenotomy? And indeed, you're probably thinking of exactly what this is, which is recurrence of thymoma. So here it is. Now, the patient had that thymectomy in the 1990s. And this isn't that unusual. These are slow growing things. Recurrence may occur years later, or at least the lesion may grow very slowly over time. But this is something that was then resected, as you can see from this pathology report. So recurrent thymoma from a tumor that was resected sometime in the 19, this should say 1990s, not 1900s. That would be a long survival. All right, Jeff, those are my cases. Thanks, Howard. Yeah, that's been my experience with the thymoma recurrences. They're often very subtle and more likely, I've seen them in the pleural space and sometimes you can go back and retrospect and see them sort of slowly brewing down in a recess somewhere. All righty, uh, Seth, did you want to go next? Sure, I can. I can show your companion uh, case. And then Travis, you can go after that, or Peter, one of you two. So this is a diabetic, someone diabetic, immunocompromised, has this big, nasty Goomba, which we thought was going to be mucor, um, and has a couple other nodules scattered around. Uh, but this was extensively biopsied, and this was all staph, and he subsequently developed staph bacteremia. I actually had another case this morning of more diffuse kind of looking things, but that guy had staph uh, septic arthritis with septic emboli. So, yeah, I mean, we, we thought this was a good looking bird's nest, but um, this turned out to be staph. Hey, Seth, can you change the window and show the um, vessels there? I was just curious if there's like any. Oh, and oh, here's the other reason I really thought it was mucor. Look at the, there's a clot, which I thought was going to be local invasion right here. Oh, yeah. I actually I actually thought that was going to be like tumor, like our, not tumor, um, mucor invading the vessel. Um, but it's not, it was all staff. Cool. Thanks. And yeah. And <clears throat> here's another interesting case someone showed me and nothing I think many of us would get or any of us would get from the imaging per se. I've seen this twice other, two other times. And in those cases, it presented with something that's also quite difficult to get from imaging, but at least you may be able to suggest. Um, this guy, although was uh, quite immunocompromised, I can't, I can't remember why he was so immunocompromised. He wasn't HIV. I, I, he might have been a stem cell transplant at some point. Um, but he came in with uh, fever and cough and has all these... I don't even know how to describe them all. I mean, um, a lot of them are along the edge of, edges of vessels. I mean, maybe they're central lobular, uh, but there's there's sure a lot of them, and some of them are actually you can see some maybe some perifisial nodules, um, and they did a sputum sample, and this is what they got from the sputum sample. Nice. So, 
So this was strongyloides. Um, you have diarrhea. I ha will have to check. I think he did. Yeah, uh, that's, that's the only that, like that's the only clue that can help direct you to this diagnosis. Well, I, so I have two, I have two cases that look like acute eosinophilic pneumonia, and th that's the pattern actually most commonly ascribed. Because we looked it up, I'm like, I've never seen this uh, pattern. I mean, it makes sense because we know that the worms actually in, it go into the vessels and then invade the adjacent alveoli um, and cause inflammation, and then work their ways up into the um, airways and then work their ways up the airways into the trachea and you cough them up and then you swallow them and the whole life cycle repeats. It's one of the few uh, but, nasty critters that can complete their whole life cycle inside the human. But um, this so is hyperinfection syndrome, right? Where they overwhelm the GI mucosa and so this is all hematogenous seeding of the lungs. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. These are all within yeah. the vessels, presumably. But right, I, right. yeah, um, but have you seen, I have not seen this pattern before. I mean, again, I'm, I have an N of three, this is now three, but even looking up online, like patterns of uh, strongyloides in the lung, I just haven't seen this, but I'm guessing it's because he's immunocompromised, it's probably more florid. Um, yeah. Have you guys seen this pattern well, before? I mean, again, it's such a rare, I have a couple. I think David has shown one. I mean, again, super rare, and and you have to be immunocompromised. I think a couple of mine were transplant patients. Okay, he might yeah, have been. Yeah, he might have been a bone marrow transplant, not a lung transplant. I can't. I you know what? I can't remember. I, I'll have to well, look like, it up. But yeah, I think one of them was a re. I know one of them was a renal transplant. Yeah, I'll find them. Okay. No, that's just I. Okay. Well, that's good to know because I someone they show this as a CPC, and I'm like I I just wouldn't have guess that. I mean, I, if the cases I have were not immunocompromised and they just presented with florid DAD with superimposed edema kind of picture. Um, but okay. And it make, I mean, it makes sense from the understanding how the worms get from the GI tract into the blood vessels, into the lung, and in, but uh, I just hadn't seen it before. No, it really, uh, no Seth, it really is an ARDS. So, you know, it is a diffuse alveolar damage and it's the, you only get the this Wait, what's not what's not diffuse? I'm sorry, what's not diffuse? Or, um, it's it's diffuse alveolar damage. It's you only get this um, hyperinfection when you have immune compromise. It lets the worms, you know, basically do whatever they want. Um, and uh, did this person survive? Because it's usually yeah. you only they make the diagnosis once they, you know, they're so far gone that they they die. They very this, this thing just takes over and they usually die in a few, couple of days, but this guy survived. When, when I, I think so, let me, um, after we're done with this, I'll go offline and pull up his name in, in MRN and see. Um, yeah. They basically said all the, when they put their the bronchoscope in, it was just pouring blood. It was just yeah. blood every, you know, pouring from the, from the airways. Um, and then they literally, the path, when they sent it a path, there were just big worms crawling around on the on the slides everywhere. So, um, so this is actually DAD pathologically here. Well, I mean, it, it, there's probably a big cytokine storm, and you're, you're yeah, yeah. connection to the lungs. So, not not every one of these little dots is a worm, but I think there's a there's a lot of reaction to the presence of worms and a whole bunch of cytokines, and these people go into al diffuse alveolar damage and and die. Yeah, I don't think every, I thought every dot was, I thought the dots were more likely hemorrhage related to the worms, but maybe it's not. Again, this is complete yeah. speculation. I, I don't, I don't know. Um, and maybe it's related to a cytokine storm from, like you said. The uh, people, they will, a lot of times they will actually give people ivermectin ahead of time, but you can't get ivermectin these days. It's too busy fighting COVID. That's, that's what uh, one of my one of my colleagues just put on the chat. You know, too bad there's a national shortage of ivermectin. <laughs> a lot of our patients prophylactically. Um, this is a good case to show because I had never seen this before, and it's it just it, not that I hadn't I haven't seen a lot of things, but you know, cardiac MRI wise. I think this is really helpful if if you're going to do cardiac MR. So this was a, a young kid, water polo player, um, or I found out afterwards a water polo player who came in who had an echo after he had COVID. Then he had an echo, and the echo showed left atrial enlargement. And then you're looking at the heart, and if you measure everything, everything is big. 
And then you look at his notes, and he is a water polo uh, player at, at UCSD. So right away, you know this guy is in pretty darn good shape, and it's going to have to have a, a very large heart um, to, for his water polo playing. Uh, his EF was on the lower side of normal, which we also see in endurance athletes. That's not that fascinating. What I did find fascinating, and I hope I can find the right sequence without wasting everyone's time here because it shows up like this on my, oh, that sure isn't the right sequence. Um, here we go. And this, this is, oh my Lord, what happened here? Here we go. So if you look, there's this, can you, you, you can see this RV insertion point. And I hate calling this. Normally I say, oh, it's just you know, we sometimes the RV, and especially people with dilated cardiomyopathy, sometimes the RV kind of dips underneath. Even a normal patient, you get the RV extending inferiorly, inferior to the point of the LV. And you're just seeing gadolinium blood pool here. But this this wasn't the case. Uh, you know, in the S in the SSFPs, you can see there's a clear focus of this insertion point enhancement. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, the kid is, this up here I passed. I'm like, this kid is like, 19 years old, I don't want to, you know, it's there. What am I going to do? You know, I'm trying to downplay it. Um, he's got a little fusion, but everyone's got a little fusion. I, anyways, so I'm kind of fretting. And then one of my uh, fellows pulled up a article, if I can pull it over, uh, from JCMR showing, just recently published, showing in uh, extremely high endurance athletes that a large percentage of them, shockingly, have this specific inferior insertion point delayed enhancement, specifically local, localized to the inferior insertion point. Um, and they compared, you know, non-endurance athletes with endurance athletes, and they saw, you know, statistically very high percentage of them having this, uh, a tenfold, or three thirty-eight percent to three percent. This is normal people. So, you know, I'm I'm glad I found that because then I'm like, you know reported to occur in, in uh, endurance athletes. It's the first case I've come across like that. The other thing I'd like to point out is, you know, one of my fellows thought there was a, this huge effusion everywhere with this stuff as well. But in fact, this is just a very, very, very well thick diaphragm that I'm sure he needs for his uh, water polo playing. But I don't know if anyone else has seen that. It's the first case I've come across with that. And it's nice to know that this is I don't know if it's normal. They don't know what the long-term outcome is, it is, but at least it's it's reported to occur in high percentage of endurance athletes. Um, so that was very helpful. Like it, it was a big weight off my shoulders because I didn't have to, you know, I, I don't want this kid to, I don't know, lose a scholarship or be not allowed to play. Now, this is a case I sent to some of you as a, um, just a, what is this? Uh, it's a guy with asthma. He was here for a malignancy follow-up, uh, not this asthma, and he just has these very robust, you know, segmental and subsegmental bronchiolar calcifications. Nothing centrally, trachea, main stem bronchi, even the the lobar bronchi. Maybe here is a little bit, but really this exuberant um, calcification involving these airways. And I, I sent it out, and I'm like, I. There were some of the airways were minimally thickened, you know, in amyloid, we, we've seen some airway calcification, but they're chunky and they don't look like this. And I don't know. I, I don't know if it's related to his asthma, if it has anything to do with anything. Um, he's older. It's clearly of no importance in terms of his, uh, his cancer or his, you know, he, he doesn't have, he's not symptomatic from it. But I'm just curious if anyone else the people I showed and responded said they hadn't seen something like that. I'm just curious if anyone else had seen something like this or has a theoretic explanation. I know Travis said he wondered if it was metaplastic bone formation or cartilage formation. I can't remember which one you it's suggested. It's just really dense. I was wondering if it's all bone. Yeah, I, I don't know. I have no clue. And if you Anyways, I... I the adjacent cartilage in the in the trachea stuff, I mean, it's so much more dense. It, it is. You wonder, really, does he truly have asthma or is this somehow? Exactly. So that was the other question. Is it asthma or is this, is this something that somehow the cause, I mean, again, I, you know, I didn't 
he has a diagnosis. He's on albuterol. Supposedly, according to them, he gets better with albuterol. But you're right. I, I have we have studies going back 15 years, and this is completely unchanged. And is this somehow related to his asthma? Um, I, I don't know. I just thought I'd show that, and because that's interesting. And then, lastly, and, and very uh, quickly. Oh, Seth. Seth is yeah. albuterol the only thing that he's been given, or are there some other medications we got to look at for their potential effects on? You know, I looked, he's not on any warfarin or blood thinners or anything like that. You know, I looked at the standard things he's on. Um, he, he's had this well before his diagnosis of malignancy. And the only thing I can see he has been treated with is symptomatic albuterol. I, okay. I, I can do a deeper dive into his, um, his history, but that's all I saw. Cause I looked and I was like, is there anything here I've seen associated with this? Can you show, uh, us, his, can you show us his anterior ribs on a coronal view and let's see if there's a lot of calcification and anterior rib cartilage. Nope, not really. Nope. Actually, it looks better, probably better than mine, yeah. <laughs> it's nice for teaching anatomy because it shows on the axial the transition between cartilage, cartilaginous bearing bronchi and non cartilage bearing bronchioles. So it's a nice teaching case where in the lungs we make that transition from bronchi to bronchioles, approximately where, yeah. <laughs> um, and then this case, this is just, I had to show this for the iatrogeny segment. Um, these are two cases that are, uh, here's, here's one pacer that somehow on the outside got put into a funky place. Um, you can see that uh, although this could theoretically be fooled for a right ventricle placement, the posterior directed one into the most posterior chamber would be very concerning for a, uh, as well as the anterior placement. One? And then here's another one that we just got a CT on showing a nice placement into the aorta and on the lateral. And then here are the associated uh, CTs. I mean, I, Just, I, th I, I showed I showed one of these like six or seven years ago at UCSF, and it was a TAVR workup where it was totally incidental. But the I just had never seen that before. Now, so you have two of them? Yeah, two, we have a couple more. Someone else showed me one. Oh my god! Yeah, this one's one's, one's a dual lead, oh and the other is a single lead. And um, yeah, no, it's it's pretty. So we have we have three of those now between the two of us. Yeah. No, How does this really happen? I mean, I mean, when they. <laughs> no. I mean. I don't know. When, I, I think... my, my, when, when someone shared me these cases today, someone shared it with me because we had a. Uh, this one was this one was had a CT. This CT is from today, and she shared with me this case and the older case, and I'm like, please tell me these are released on on the outside, and she's like, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so. Good it's, golly. Yeah. One Anyways, would think that they would be able to discover abnormal sensing or something on, I presume they do some kind of routine interrogation of the function of leads after placement at some point, even if the procedure well, goes smoothly. Well, they always get a chest x-ray at least. I mean, <laughs> the chest x-ray would say, hey, this, this doesn't look right, um, but, yes. but who knows? Yeah, unless they're walking around with transposition, which they're right. not. Yeah. Good golly. Yeah. Anyways, those are uh, those are my right. cases. Thanks. <laughs> okay, Jeff, you ready? Yeah. Hey, Seth, I I pulled up an old PowerPoint where I've got a couple of these strongyloides cases. I'll start with that. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So here, let me. Okay, you see that? Yep. Yeah. So this yeah. is one guy from Mexico who came to UCSF and, and got a renal transplant a couple months before this and presented diarrhea, worsening sepsis. The diarrhea and abdominal purpura were the key. And you can see it's very similar to yours, right? These just tiny little, probably vascular nodules. He has more lung injury at this point. Um, and then I'll just go, I'll just, so here's the video of, our, of this worm. This was on a BAL. And then yeah. you can see it 
moving around. This is these are a couple of other cases that I had collected. That looks like from, that looks like it. Yeah, yeah, the one. Okay, yeah, from residency or or one of these was for memory. Same thing. Chemo for this one of these was chemo. I guess the other one was kidney transplant. Yeah. So it's something that you know keep in the back of your mind. Obviously, and I always ask the ID folks if patients have diarrhea or abdominal symptoms when they you know when they present like this but yeah. for ours they were convinced that he got it from he he works in mexico and they're convinced he got it from the literally like the local taco truck on his construction site they they're convinced it came from there i thought i, I don't know how you prove it came from the taco truck okay but. yeah this is a, this is an interesting case and you know it's just less common manifestations of a de disease that's fairly common, at least at academic institutions. So 19 year old referred, and this is evaluate for LAM, and she has a history of tuberous sclerosis, and I'll get to that. And you can see she has a grand total of two cysts. She had one there in the left upper lobe, and I know she's got one somewhere else, and now I can't remember where it is. I may have already scrolled past it, um, but you know, and, and so reading this out with the resident and they're not too impressed about the diagnosis of, of tuberous sclerosis, but of course, there are a lot of other manifestations that we can and should look for. And you can even see one of them here on the soft tissue windows. This is some of the more impressive intramyocardial fatty foci that I've seen. She has some in the septum, some along the inferior wall of the left ventricle as well. And Seth, do you have any histologic cases of this? From it's, AIRP? You know what the sad thing is? No. And I don't know why we don't have more. I mean, because the question is, everyone calls them lipomas, which they may be. They say they're not angiomyolipomas specifically, but I can't find – there's one case yeah. that's a PATH report. I, I don't well, see – like a case I report. don't like lipoma. Yeah. I, I mean, that's why I just – I like the intramyocardial fatty foci that is – Yeah. No. I, in the literature. Um. And then you can see her her right kidney is notably absent. She had a nephrectomy at age 10 or 11. She's probably got a couple of small AMLs in her left kidney. And I've shown this before too, but this is the other one. And this is a, as good of an example as I've seen is, especially if you're helping to distinguish LAM from tuberous sclerosis complex, look for the, the sclerotic bone lesions. And there was a paper in radiology. I think it was like either two or three lesions if, if you saw them in the spine, that was a good predictor of it being, you know, fairly good discriminator of it being tuberous sclerosis complex. And she's got like dozens and they're basically just little bone islands. And looking it up, they th just think it's, I was trying to look at the pathogenesis of these and it's just some generic explanation that they derive from neural crest cells, just like all of this other stuff. So I don't know, but these are all findings that can be seen. And so, yeah, so she's got one or two lung cysts. I think they're just going to watch that. I'll show you the, her brain is pretty impressive. You can see she's got a lot of, of subependymal tumors and she has some uh, cortical tubers as well. And interestingly, she does not have a family history, uh, but I was, they did a genetic analysis and she has, oh, come on, open up. Maybe it's not going to open. She had a form for us, uh, you can see, or de novo mutation, the tuberous sclerosis, the TSC2 gene. So these are autosomal dominant. So that's why that this is, you know, even without a family history, she has TSC. Travis, if you display the, the lung and make it a MIPS, does she have any discernible tiny nodules in the lungs? Like that might like be MMPH. the MMPH? Yeah, not really. Huh? Not really. No, okay. I mean, I don't no. give her one little juxtaplural lymph node there. I don't know. Yeah, these just are two nondescript. Okay. Probably just little intrapulmonary lymph nodes. But yeah, lots of other manifestations of tuberous sclerosis complex. Um, now I'm just, th oh, this is one. We've seen a couple of these, and, and this was shown to me by a colleague in the context of disappointed that the path didn't show what it was expected to show. And this is a 23-year-old who presented with hemoptysis. 
And you'll see this was the, the PE study. This was all done at the outside hospital. And you can see there's there's looks to be a vessel arising from the aorta here. And we're in still in a pulmonary artery phase. And so you can see she's got pulmonary arteries else in the in the upper lobe, but not really in the left lower lobe. And I think we can explain why the left inferior pulmonary vein is less opacified because most of the blood is being derived from a systemic source. And when they did a repeat angio, and I'll show you this here, I'll show you the lungs first. You can see that the, the bronchial branching pattern though is normal. There's a superior segment, and then there are basilar segments that all communicate with the airways. And presumably this is the site of her of her hemorrhage in the left lower lobe. And when we look at the, the vessels, you can clearly see the pulmonary artery. There's a branch to the superior segment of the left lower lobe. Actually, it's this one right here. And then no other pulmonary arterial branches. And then everything else is derived from the left lower lobe. The basilar segments are all derived from the aorta. And so this was kind of shown as like, oh, I can't believe the pathologist didn't call this a sequestration. And that's because this is not a sequestration. I know we've shown some of these, but I do, I, we did get path proof on this. This is, has been described in the literature as just anomalous systemic supply to the basilar segments. And Jeff, I think you've shown cases of this even in the right lower lobe as well, haven't you? Yeah, it's more, it seems to be more common down there. It's uh, seen several times. I think it's yeah. just along the and, spectrum and, it's just probably an embryonic pathway that doesn't regress and probably yeah. grows, and that's why it's such a big vessel. And I know David has shown, I was going back through old cases. I know David has shown one. I've shown one. This is the only one I've I seen. Showed a, I showed a really big on. one. I showed a really big one a couple of months ago. Yeah, yeah, but I didn't. But um, yeah. we don't have path. Uh, we have angio and stuff. Yeah, but just to distinguish, you know, and this, it's not unusual for these patients to present with with hemoptysis and with hemorrhage from the systemic supply, but just to distinguish this from a sequestration that this is still, you know, this has normally developed airways. It's just, as Jeff said, an embryologic pathway here that doesn't regress. And then show one more really quick and Seth, you'll like this. I'll go straight to the CT. So this is last summer, 40 year old guy cough fever to 103 in, you know, during the pandemic, diffuse central lobular nodules, you can see everywhere, and involving every single secondary pulmonary lobule. Uh, his right heart is normal, his pulmonary artery is normal, he's not injecting. And when the clinician, when the pulmonologist talked to him, he said he had vaped a couple of years ago, but hadn't done it since then. Uh, so they couldn't figure out what this was. They thought it was an exposure of some sort. Somebody said infection. They gave him a they gave him a course of azithromycin, and I think we all, you know, agree most infections don't cause diffuse central lobular nodules like this. He transiently gets better, then comes back five months later, same same thing, cough, fever, and now you can see how much more discrete these central lobular nodules are. And at only at this point, after heavy questioning, does he admit that he has actually been vaping THC? You know, he's COVID negative times 20 during this whole time, or however many times they tested it. But this was, uh, an, you know, he never really had severe symptoms that warranted admission to a hospital, but this is another evaluate with the central lobular nodular pattern. And he um, st did stop vaping after that. And now you can see four months later that almost completely resolved. So. That's nice. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Very cool. nice. All right. Those are mine. All right. Peter, you got anything this week? I don't have anything this week, Jeff. That's all right. I can show a few cases. Let's see. Uh, it's gratifying that that guy got better. It's, it's you know, that's a reason to tell him to stop vaping. Yeah. So this is an interesting case. I'll be curious if anyone else has seen anything like this. And uh, I, I did a little looking into um, um, it earlier. So this guy presented with some chest pain and his frontal radiograph doesn't look terribly exciting. And this is his lateral. And I'll just point out he has a, you can see he's got a pectus deformity there. And then there's sort of this dense tissue, but 
I, at the time, really not really noticed and probably not important. Um, so nothing acute going on. So he had a CT for looking for PE. And what's interesting is he has this funny looking high attenuation blob. It looks very well circumscribed. It looks artificial located in the subcutaneous tissues. You see it's, and it's even conforms to his pectus deformity. Mm. Um, so it turns out in his record, he had this repair done way back in the 1970s. So, um, I reached out the to colonic, a, the colonic interposition. <laughs> I reached out to an esteemed colleague who may not have been practicing them, but may have seen some of these patients a little bit later, um, but hadn't seen anything like that. So I, I did a little digging. I found this nice article in the history of pectus repairs going all the way back to like way back early 20th century. And, and they did all sorts of things. And then with Dr. Nuss, that whole Nuss procedure became the standard. But there is a body of literature using silicone implants and silicone injections to fix the cosmetic defect. It doesn't fix the deformity. And you can see his pectus is pretty mild. Um, so may, it probably doesn't cause respiratory compromise that you may see in like a Marfan syndrome. But for cosmesis, uh, in the, pa in the uh, plastic surgery literature, there were a couple papers talking about using silicone implants and silicone injections. And going back to the, it's really dense even for silicone, but there's like, like this little thing here, kind of looks like we've seen some free silicone uh, or when it leaks out. So I suspect that's what it is. Unfortunately, it just, I went all as far back as I could go in the chart. Uh, it was so long ago, there's no records of it anywhere. But I was curious, has anyone ever seen something like this as a nope. type of, uh, uh, Definitely type? not. Definitely <laughs> not. Nope. Love it. Yeah, that was kind of fun. And in retrospect, yeah, in retrospect, you can see on the radiograph, but you have to really look for it and it wouldn't occur to you to do so. Okay. Um, this is kind of a, cute little case I came across the other day, um, found an old study that shows it better. So um, an incidental finding of a really tiny vessel running lateral to the aortic arch. And one of the rules I teach my residents is there should never be a vertical vessel here. If it is, it's either a left SVC draining down or it is a um, partial nominous venous drainage draining up. And in this case, it's kind of cool. So clearly we can see it connect to this vein coming into the lung. So this is anomalous venous drainage, but what caught my attention is it keeps going down and it connects into the superior pulmonary vein. So you've got effectively, you've got the left atrium communicating with the left brachiocephalic vein. Now the atrium should be higher pressure. So I would suspect blood is going north and it would depend on the dynamics of this lung. And it, who knows, it may change with exercise or exertion. But I don't recall seeing a, I've seen a, a continue on as a left SVC, but I don't recall seeing one uh, still communicate with the left superior vein directly. Have any of you ever seen that? I just, show, I just showed one a few weeks ago, and I think you might have been gone. Yeah, Travis. I was gone a few Travis weeks. Travis edu educated me because I said I hadn't seen either, and he said, oh, it's a persistent left cardinal vein. Yeah, there um, yeah the levoatrial cardinal vein. Persistent levoatrial cardinal vein. I'm like, oh, okay. And sure enough, I looked it up, and that's exactly what it was. <laughs> okay, levoatrial cardinal vein. I will rename the case. But yeah, there's a. That's just a pretty example that happened to have nice contrast. Yeah. So I guess I literally you know, showed, showed one six weeks ago. Four weeks ago, yeah. I guess the shunt is so but small Jeff, that it doesn't matter. Well, but it, it can be bidirectional. These pa there are case reports of TIAs in patients like this. Oh, really? So my guy had really bad CTEF and huge right atrial pressure. So you have to imagine blood was actually shunting from the systemic venous into the left atrium. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, it's, that's a nice example. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for educating me on that one. Uh, this is kind of an impressive case. It has a really, it just got a nice imaging. So this patient presented with hemoptysis and you can see the upper mediastinum is very abnormal. Uh, there's an effusion. If you go to the lateral, clearly there's something bad going here behind the air column. So it looks like an esophageal type mass there. Um, so they did a CT scan and we have this really ugly looking esophageal mass. And you notice there's indentation and irregularity of the tracheal lumen right about the, that level there. Uh, and this looks like primary esophageal cancer. It was biopsied and indeed is a squame. It's quite extensive. It goes down and um, Quite, quite a long ways. Uh, and because of that hemoptysis, they did a bronchoscopy. And you can see um, this is the uh, mass in the actual airway of the trachea. And so the uh, interventional pulmonologist uh, kind of debrided a lot of it there. Um, 
just to debulk it. And then they ended up putting a stent across it here to uh, just prevent the, the fistulization, at least temporarily. I also have a nice esophagram um, pre-stent, but you can see that you just got this really ugly looking esophagus. Go back up here, you can just see the really irregular contours there. So this is just an ugly tumor. Here's another image there just showing that real tight lesion there and then just this marked irregularity. So um, a really bad squame with a esophago, uh, there we go, esophago tracheal fistula and direct invasion. So uh, presenting with hemoptysis. So um, of course, I've seen several of these when they get treated. And these these actually do pretty well with chemo radiation, at least temporarily um, for symptom control. But you really worry about this um, becoming a fistula. And of course, those are associated with high mortality because of the spillage into the airways and sepsis and all that. And so a really ugly tumor. Mm. Um, this is kind of an interesting case. So this patient, and I never got down, I get, get the order here. Um, yeah, this patient, let's see, I want the axials. So this patient had presented with a cough and has a really nice looking organizing pneumonia pattern on CT, and then has this bigger mass here. And so COVID was negative, and so was was treated for uh, I don't think I remember what they what they tried to figure out the OP was from, but ended up getting a bunch of serial imaging. So uh, here's the patient a couple months later, and you can see the OP is kind of moving around a little bit there and doing its things, but this mass kind of just stayed there. It's a little smaller, but it looks different than the rest of it. And I've got serial imaging showing the OP evolving. Here we are with the nice sort of atoll uh, down there, but again this mass just getting a little bit smaller cell. So finally, someone puts a needle in this thing um, as it's getting smaller and um, gets coxy out of this. And I don't think the OP is at all related to the coxy. I'm not sure what's causing the OP. I don't think anyone ever did. They put the, but you know, of course they're a little hesitant to put them on steroids for this, but um, have, you guys have seen more coxy than I have because um, you've all practiced or practiced on the West Coast. Have you ever seen coxy induced OP? I suspect the this was, this coxie was an incidental finding here. He didn't really seem to have symptoms from that. Um, and it was kind of going away spontaneously on its own anyway. Um, but I suspect it was just sort of an innocent, uh, just an incidental finding and the OP is totally unrelated. But have you guys ever seen coxie associated OP? Well, OP, uh, OP could be um, eosinophilic pneumonia actually, and that is associated with coxie. So okay. coxie is one cause of eosinophilia and eosinophilic pneumonia. So these patches could be you know, using of like pneumonia, which can have organizing pneumonia features under the microscope Absolutely. too. Absolutely. They can move around and evolve. I think that's the most that's the most compact explanation because okay. of the known as that would make sense. Yeah, we know I mean, no one ever put a needle on any of this stuff, just they were worried that this wasn't like a lung cancer or something. But yeah, so um okay, that makes more sense. And and his exposure was very limited. Um, he had been in an endemic area for a brief period of time. That's that's how we see coxies. People who travel there either for the winter or even just for a vacation or weekends or something. So uh, we do we do still encounter coxies. It's just not on our radar. We don't see a lot of it. Um, that's why. All right, and I probably have time for one more. Um, this is something I had not seen before. So this is a patient. Uh, let's get the timing right. With common variable immunodeficiency who uh, back years ago had a CT, it's expiratory, it's not a great scan, but you can see there is a background of pretty well-defined little, uh, or maybe not so well-defined, but all these nodules, um, and has a big-ish spleen, we don't see much of it, but it looks a little rounded, a little full. So um, in this context of not being acutely ill, uh, a presumptive diagnosis, and has pulmonary hypertension too, of, um, what they call granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease. And I don't know what the pathologists like to call it now. I know they don't particularly like that term, but that's what we have. Um, and this patient was treated over the years with IVIG. And so this was a follow-up scan. And you can see that the the lungs have sort of changed in their appearance. The pulmonary hypertension is still there, but um, the nodules have waned quite a bit. And there's almost like a, a and down low, there's almost like a fibrotic appearance to it. You see some ground glass, a little bit of reticulation, some, and some traction bronchiectasis. And I've not seen that. I mean, I've not seen a lot of people with C, uh, CBID um, treated 
with IVIG, but um, has anyone ever seen that as a just a either a complication from the the chronic inflammation or as a treatment effect where there's some sort of uh, immune response that causes local tissue injury? I mean, it almost looks like an NSIP like look to it. Has that basal? Can you go effect. back to the initial? Can you go back to the initial study? Yeah, it's not a great scan, but you can see there's just all these nodules. But I didn't see any fibrosis back then. Hmm. Yeah, I mean it. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I haven't seen the progress. I just haven't seen a lot of cases followed no. up. I mean, it kind of it makes sense to some degree, but I, I just don't haven't seen it. Yeah, or I wonder if if it allows their immune response, allowed them to respond to whatever is going on. I mean, down there, but I just thought kind of. They biopsy this, Jeff? No. His pulmonary hypertension made him too high risk, I believe. So anyway, it was just kind of an odd case. Does anyone, Jeff, do you, is there some kind of causal association between pulmonary arterial hypertension and GLILD and, uh, and CVID? Not that. Or does I'm he have that for another reason? Yeah, not that I'm aware of. I mean, it wasn't horrible pulmonary hypertension. You can see the RV doesn't look terribly angry, but um the central pas are quite large um and the, even the peripheral pas are a little bit big so i don't know unless there's an underlying connective tissue disease that hadn't been recognized but i seriously doubt that given that it would just be like too many different things but um, yeah but i talked to the, the pulmonologist and he said that was what happens the patient had gotten ivig over the years and uh, i guess the the but maybe it's just the, maybe it's just a sequel of the chronic inflammation um, the chronic uh, lymphocytic and granulomatous inflammation in the lungs led to the fibrosis, and it's not the treatment, but rather the disease itself that they were treating. But unfortunately, like, there's a gap, so I, I can't see the evolution over time. But um, that's the whole the case is, is is kind of perplexing. The features are odd. Yeah, it's a tough diagnosis, and I know our pathologist doesn't like the term. I don't. They don't really have a good term, but um, I think it's a thing we don't understand very well. So. All right. Well, I will stop there. It is time. Uh, thanks, everyone. Those were great cases. And yeah, great. Thank you. All right. Talk to you next thanks, week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.